And um, getting back to the Chad Morgan show, um, would you be able to tell us that uh, famous story about um, the Chad shooting the can off your head? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a bloody old story. <laughs> um, there's, there's been some variations in that story, but it was fairly simple. We um, we weren't. Uh, it was a very odd time. We had a drink, you know. Yeah. Right. There wasn't. There was no booze and because we were doing hundreds of miles between each show and uh, out back Queensland and in places we drove through paddocks right open gates and followed the, 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 the most worn track through the grass okay. to get where we're going and uh, very little very little of that caper but we're driving along one morning and uh, I suppose 10 or 11 o'clock and we travelled all night from the last show and we were going and we were, And it seemed like everything on the car was about to rattle off. And Chad pulled up and he, he was ahead of me. And when I caught up to him, I said to him, what's wrong? He said, I feel like a road leveller. And I said, yeah, it didn't dawn on me first. And he brought out, out of the fridge, he brought two cans of beer, four eggs. I thought, well, I don't usually drink through the day, but by God, I'd think I would. So we had a couple of mouthfuls, by God, it tasted good. And I said to him, I have a, a call from nature. Without going into too much detail. Yes. And down in the slope, going down the hill, and it, where it was cleared, this track, Right down the hill, I suppose about a hundred yards down the thing. I went for a walk and there was an obliging log there, right? So I, I um, positioned myself appropriately on the log, finished the can, and he's standing on the other side of his car up on the road. So I yelled out to him, I said, oh, knock this off, because he's standing there with his rifle, See? And he was he was probably the second best shot I've ever seen in my life, you know, Chad. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, he's a good shot. Tex Morton was, was probably the best. Yeah. But, um, but Chad was, he was brilliant. Practiced all the time. And I said to him, here, knock this off. He said, no, 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 no. I said, go on, you can do it. So he stood there for a while, and I sat there for a while. With this can on my head. And very slowly he put the rifle over the top of the car and aimed it down at me. And I thought, this may not be the best idea I ever had, but we're committed. So I didn't move. And I saw the gun jump and I felt something sting me on the top of the head. The can was gone. I'm still alive. The, the, the speed the bullet knocked it off, stung me on the top of the head, right? So I went and picked up the can. Now, see the can's got a ring around the top here, yep. right? The bullet split the ring straight through both sides on the top. Half the width of the bullet hit the can, right? It only two or three millimetres higher and he would have missed it. Whoa. That's how good he was. That's how good. And um, yeah, champion shot. And should have kept the can. I never did. I left it there. But um, it assisted assisted me with the original function that I went there for. And <laughs> we we've often laughed about it since, you know. <laughs> and I said to him, I never let you do it again. You're too shaky now. <laughs> you, had, you had your one chance. <laughs> oh, we were in, in Queensland and I had another session to do with EMI. So I left Queensland and I come down the New England Highway and I got to Tamworth and I looked in the, where that big motel is now and this is going back 19, 1960 or something, 50, 50, 55 something years ago. 
and there was a big tent there, great big tent, and it was had on the front of it Carol's Varieties. Yeah. You know about them at all? I've done a bit of history on them, yep. Lucky Grills and Jeff Mack. <laughs> well, Jeff Mack had, has been a, a, been a friend of mine for a lifetime, and Jeff Mack deserves some sort of an award. And I wrote and told uh, the uh, people, the uh, famous Australians, right, to consider Jeff Mack, and I never got an answer. Right. Um, I wrote and told him Chad Morgan's story, right, and he got his award, but they wouldn't do it for Jeff Mack, and I don't know why, but anyway, they were there. So I, I thought I'd call in and say good day. So I went in and said good day, Jeff, and lucky. And, um, and Jeff said, you're going to stay and see the show? I said, why not? So I stopped and saw the show. And after the show, he said, come, we'll have some supper in the caravan. So I sat in there right, with Jeff and Tammy. And uh, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to Sydney to make another record. He said, I've got a song nearly finished you could take with you if you like. Right? I said, yeah, what is it? He said, it's called I've Been Everywhere. And he sang it for me. And I said to him, Jeff, that'd take me a month to learn it. I haven't got the time. And that's the best thing I've ever done. Because, um, um, uh, what's the name made of? Lucky uh, Star. Yeah, made a, made a hit of it. Mm -hmm. And done it probably the best anybody could do it. Hey? So, um, <laughs> Hank Snow made a mess of it. Oh, with yeah. all the... Well, the American, <laughs> American, American something, and he didn't even play his guitar while he was doing it. <laughs> Somewhere along the road, there you took about ten years' spell or something from country music. Not so. Not so. Not so. No, no I, I, there was, there was, wasn't going to be any money or fame or anything in country music for me, and I, ne I never did it for the money. And I didn't do it for the fame. I did it because I loved it. Yeah. I loved every note of country music I ever heard or ever played, right? And uh, it has been it has been uh, the greatest joy of my life to have been a tiny part of the country music industry, and that's all I ever wanted, mm -hmm. right? It's absolutely money could not buy the happiness it gave me. Right. It's just, it's just great to be a part of it, and um, uh, I'm very grateful for that. And as I said, I I put money into land and um, and the first lot of land I built a house on, and and I put money into a few other things, right as I got got the money, and. Uh, I started a, a couple of companies in Sydney uh, and I had um, about nine trucks running down there at one time and uh, employing about 15 people and uh, I was uh, singing songs around um, around the clubs and pubs when I could yep. right. but I never um, never wrote to any magazines and nobody ever reported it or said anything about it we just did it as a as a sort of a party you know and um, I got posters out there of all the shows not all the shows but some of the shows I did in those days but um, people would ring up and say can you do a show down at Liverpool or uh, or out at such and such you know and if I could I went <laughs> you know and um, uh, then uh, and people thought uh, that it wasn't doing anything, but I was all the time. Well, all the time. Bill Kelly's uh, show, you remember Bill Kelly? No. Well, Bill was a clever fellow. Uh, when I had my own show, he, he was on it. And um, he's a clever man. Uh, he never smoked his own cigarettes. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> No, he's a nice bloke, Bill. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he sang a lot like Hank Snow, played a guitar, and um, it, it, it was pretty popular around the, around the place. We had a, 
we are a program on 2SM in Sydney and this is before television and we got pick of the air week after week mm. week after week we got pick of the air right and um, and all them fellas are on it you know they, they all came in there um, uh, everybody you can think of just about um, and of course Nola and Alan Hurst you remember them? Uh, yes. Nola had a beautiful voice right she was a very attractive woman and, and had a lovely voice, right? And uh, Frank Ifield and uh, Jimmy and, and um, uh, uh, lots of others came there. And uh, at that time, television at that stage was in its infancy. They just started. And the promoters of television came to Ted Quigg and asked him would he, would he put our on the trial show on television. Wow. And he said yes he would, right, if there was an agreeable arrangement. And he asked everybody not to break away, take an individual offer, stay together, and we would get on television with our show. And, um, and that and negotiations went on for a, a week or two. And uh, Mrs. Ifield, who managed Frank, um, she agreed to let Frank go on the television, right? And he was probably he was he was the best entertainer on our show at the time. Hey? And uh, uh, when that happened, they they picked out each one separately, right? And and paying peanuts, right? Didn't have to pay for the show. <laughs> so there, Rex Ellis was there too. Right. <laughs> I might tell you. Um, uh, when Ted Quigg had the radio program on 2KA, one Sunday we were listening to, the, to, to his show at Granville and he played Pub With No Beer, right? And I rung him straight through to the station and I said to him, bring that record home, I want to learn it. And he said, why? I said, because that's a hit. Right? He said, oh, I don't know. Uh, are you sure? I said, yeah, of course, I want to learn it. Well, he brought it home and I played it twice and I knew it. I knew it. And the, the very next Tuesday night when we went in to record our program, I sung Pub With No Beer on the, on the program. And for three consecutive weeks, I sang it. And on the third week, I said to the people before I sang it, I said, here's a song that's... A, that's outselling everything in Australia and it's not on the hit parade I wonder why and sang it again right and it came out on the Tuesday night on the Friday night it was on the 2KY hit parade whoa yeah <laughs> straight in <laughs> and from and like the man said the rest is history yes right? <laughs> so I didn't do it anymore and the next week Rex Dallas sung it and the white one. Yeah, great thing. The famous public no beer. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, Al Gordon Parsons, right? There was a big argument over it. Somebody, somebody had a um, had a, a thing similar to it, and Gordon dressed it up and and made it made the song out of it. You know. Yeah. Be... Now in the nineteen seventies. Uh, you did uh, record for Hadley Studios in oh, Tamworth. Oh yes, yeah. Yes, I was, I was doing a, a tour over in Tasmania and um, I, um, I just forget who was, but um, uh, Kevin Flight was there, you know, Paul Lesser. Yep. And um, I ran into um, uh, to Scotty, Eric Scott, and he was working on an announcer on 7 LA, Launceston. And he said to me, um, he was going to start a country music record label. Would I put a couple of songs on for him? And I said to him, if you, if you want to start a country music label, I'll put some songs on for you. And uh, don't pay me anything. Keep whatever you get for him. You know, help him get started. And we did, uh, in, in one hall, he had um, 
he had his recorder going and I made three or three EPs for him over there and uh, the last one uh, Paul Lester played guitar for me and he in a in a pub in a pub beer garden oh yeah and um, and Eric had his recording equipment in the ladies toilet <laughs> and he'd come to the door and he'd go like that give us a high sign and we had to count one two three four to get back to his controls right and away we go and uh, anyway it turned out quite good turned out good yeah oh, okay i went to new zealand on um the first time i think in 1979 yep. was the first year that i went to new zealand and i went there a lot of years after that uh, mostly two on the, the north island and um, in later years, I got to, um, to do the South Island and I had the great pleasure of singing a song in the hall at Nelson, where Tex Morton came from. Oh, yeah, yes. And uh, uh, I saw his grave where him and his, and his parents are buried and uh, there was a, one red rose growing there <laughs> on, the, on the grave. And the house where he grew up in, um, a nice little old house, and his sister still lived there. Okay. And um, in Nelson, they had a um, information centre, and somebody said to me, "There's a plaque up there commemorating Tex Morton somewhere up the road there." Oh yeah, right. So I went to the information centre, and I said to the people on the counter, "I said." Uh, there's a plaque somewhere here commemorating Tex Morton. They said, who? <laughs> I said, probably one of the most famous people come out of New Zealand. His name was Tex Morton. Right? Oh, no, we know nothing about that. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's, that astounded me. So I went outside and we're walking around the street and I asked a couple of people and they said, oh, no, we're visitors. We don't know. And then I ran into this old bloke, he was sitting on the, on the seat on the side of the street and asked him, he said, look, he said, I believe up that street over there, there was, a, there was something. He didn't remember what it was. So we went up there, um, Cliffy, um, the fellow I went over to, I was travelling with, and uh, uh, we walked up the street. And here was this concrete slab, only about a metre high, and it leaned back at an angle, bare, right? And you could see where something had been glued to it, right? So the plaque that commemorated Tex Morton, somebody had stolen it. Oh. They'd taken it. And Cliff said to me, look at that, because he was a Tex Morton fan too, you know. He said, look at that. Now, who bothers stealing that? I said to him, if I knew it wasn't on there too tight, I'd have taken it myself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they said, um, when we did the show in the hall, I was talking to the promoters and they said, oh yeah, the council were aware of it and they would replace it. And I asked him when, he did, when they did, would he take a photo and send me a photo of it? And they said they would. And that's... Oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, so I, I gather I'll never get it, you know. But, the, you know, it just goes to show you. He said, when you're gone, you will never be missed. That's true of those words. Yeah. Um, and to finish off this interview, uh, Trevor, um, what's your thoughts of today's country music in, in, in Australia? Of what? Of today's country music in Australia. Today's country music in Australia. Your thoughts? I pres I would think that um, everything evolves, Jack. Yep. Doesn't it? Sure does. It changes. It evolves, and it's subject to all the the changes in um, in attitudes, environments, in um, everything, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So it's like Nostradamus said, the, um, the world is unfolding as it should. 
and this bugger all we can do about it. <laughs> True. <laughs> but I feel that um, there's a lot of people uh, who admire the old original grassroots country music and, um, and Slim with his story songs, right, ballads, I, I believe they, they will last probably into eternity, sort of. There'll always be somebody who remembers uh, some of the songs, you know. It's like Click Go the Shears or something that, you know, or whatever, you know, happy birthday to you or something. They'll all, somebody will remember some of those songs. Yep. There are, there are probably 50% uh, of the songs are, um, are disposable, right? They will disappear forever. And the other 50% are pages of our history book, if you like to listen to the stories. Mm -hmm. So they're not country music of Australia, they're, they're, um, they're um, the, the history of Australia is in the songs. Eh? Mm -hmm. So that won't be forgotten, they'll be referred to, I'd say, on and off. I think so. Yeah. And um, things will change, uh, the beats will change. Um, I'm pretty um, uh, probably old-fashioned, but I thought if you bother to write a song and sing it to somebody, you, you use the opportunity to say something, mm -hmm. right? something meaningful, meaningful, something to share an experience with the with the the people you're singing the song to, you know, because they've lived in the same era. They breathe the same air, they have the same emotions, love and hate and all the rest of it, don't they? They do. So if you can communicate with them through through that medium, right, that's the idea of the whole thing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they put the lyrics up on the, on the screen for these latest songs they're singing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and to me they're goobly gook. I can't make any sense out of them at all. <laughs> Tom T. Hall said, you, you've got to write about what you see yep. and what you experience, the things you see in your life. And that's what I write about, things I see and how they affect me. And uh, I wrote one about uh, a tribute to old Tex and um, everybody else wrote a song about him saying, oh, he done this and he done that and he, you know, he leapt over tall buildings. And, Eight razor blades for breakfast or whatever. But I, I wrote a song about him and I, uh, for the way his life affected mine. Yep. His life affected mine. And I, I presume the way he affected me probably had an impression on lots of other people too. Because he, he had the unique position of being the only one at the time. Apart from Wolf Carter and Jimmy Rogers, right, who were foreigners, yeah. he, he was the only sort of semi-homegrown, even though he come from New Zealand, right, he was, he was adopted by Australia as, as the father of our country music, you know, and a uh, bloody character, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I, did a, I did a couple of shows with him. We, um, we uh, were up in Queensland doing the Ipswich uh, agricultural show. Okay. See? And um, years before, I was singing in a hotel in Queensland, and a fellow came up and said to me, Can you sing Old Boko? Okay. Oh, yeah. I said to him, I'll sing you what I know of it. Right? So I sang what I know of it, and I was sitting on the edge of the stage having a smoke and a drink. And he came up and he said, Do you know why I want to hear that? I said, no, why? He said, because my name's Boko. And I said, ah, you're pulling my leg, aren't you? He said, no, 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 I'm serious. He said, that song was written about my, either my father or my grandfather. I said, I thought it was written about a horse or a dog or something. <laughs> no fear. So he pulled out his license and showed me. And here it is, Boko. His name is Boko. And I 
thought, when I see text, I'm going to ask him about that. So we're doing the Ipswich uh, Agricultural Show. Him and I, they, they've got a, a thing set up in front of the grandstand, uh, and the finish of the show that night, we sing some songs to the grandstand, and that's the end of the proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> So he's down in the caravan, where I am now, and we're having a, I don't know, drinking something, tea or some coffee or whatever. <laughs> and I said to him, years ago, I text you recorded a song called Old Boko and Me. Yeah, he said, oh yes, yes, years ago. I said, who was Boko? He said, how the hell would I know? <laughs> And I thought, well, straight from the horse's mouth, I haven't got the answer. I couldn't believe it. Because he's supposed to be a memory expert, you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, so I never said anything. You don't argue with him. He was a cranky old bug if you want to argue with him. <laughs> 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 anyway, I put in that Tex Morton Travelling Museum together yep. for Smithy down the road. It took me a couple of months to get it all sorted out and put up. The 78s had to be padded and a special rubber ring put in the middle for the screw to hold them. Okay. Right? And then a, the, the label on the back had to be transposed and stuck to the front so you could read both labels from the front, you know. Took a lot of time. Anyway, I was setting it all up. And the gear we had that came from all over Australia and around the world, right? bags and boxes of gear sorting through what to put up and what to put away and then I come across this little cassette with no name on it and I thought I'll play that while I'm sorting out all this stuff and uh, it even had the little blocks that it used to advertise in the newspapers when he was going around the lead blocks that they used to print the whole lot there anyway I thought I'd put this on and play it so I plan away, and the next thing, Tex comes on and recites a poem, right? About this fella that was had a tiff with this girlfriend, right? And uh, she was at a race meeting somewhere, and he he had a tiff and got on the booze, and all the rest. Of it. Went over to the race meeting, and and uh, he didn't want to talk to her and anything, and the kangaroo bounced by and everybody jumped on their horses and took off after this kangaroo right and, it, and he, he, this fella jumps on his horse and he's tearing through the bush and he leaves all the other riders behind right and he's tearing them right and they come to the fence and he put the horse to it right and he, he um, but he missed and went through it right and crashed on the other side and landed on the rider, right? And um, he, um, Boko was dead and I was blind, he said. And when I come to knew my blindness, I come to knew her kindness because she said she'd take him anyway, but he wouldn't let her be a cripple's wife, you know? It's a famous poem, it's bloody good stuff. Anyway, it was written by an Englishman back when the shearing strike was on. But anyway, that's another, no, that's no, another story. <laughs> no, well that, so, oh sorry. But the horse's name was Boko. So that's yeah. what it was, it was Boko. Boko was... led the way. Right. <laughs> so it was a horse. It, it was, was a horse. Like <laughs> so that fellow, he pulled my leg, I don't know what happened there. Well now there's a true story. Oh okay. A lady came in here one night. And she looked at the board there, I've got my records there for sons. She said, you in the country music? And I said, yeah, but she said, so am I. I said, oh, really? She said, yes, I've got two dogs at home and their names are Slim and Dusty. I said, jeez, is that right? She said, yeah. So I thought, well, there's a song. quickly think about how it goes yep. and do my very best with it for you. No worries. Just north of Port Macquarie, where Janie lived alone, she 
thought she'd get herself a pub for company round the home. And as the neighbour's guilty was about to well, she thought she'd pay a visit and see if they needed help. The pups arrived like sausages with the kelpie's dexterous tongue. A few old rags, a couple of towels, the cleaning up was done. And as they stood admiring this wrinkled and hairy bunch, the kelpie never said a word as she turned on their lunch. It was then that Jamie noticed, falling down the back, a little pup that they had missed still in his little sack. She picked him up and cleaned him up and did her best for him But they both agreed his chances of survival were quite slim But I've never seen a Kelpie that gave up without a fight When weaning time come round young Slim was full of bark and bite The pups all looked like Kelpies except one all dusty white And the owner said that Janie could take two pups if she liked How slim and dusty come to be with Janie there A wild a pair of dogs, I doubt that you'll see anywhere A pair of playful devils wrapped up in hair and hide But Janie thinks they're lovely and they are her joy and pride Her brander is a racetrack where they tear round in the night Till Janie comes out with the broom and puts them both to flight and anything that walks or crawls gets rounded up for sure And in the morning can be found outside the kitchen door Slim's digging holes to bury bones and Dusty's digging them up And things to chase around the place they never find enough It's endless hours of rip and tear with no love for a brother And if there's nothing found to chase then when they chase each other how slim and dusty come to be with Janie there A wilder pair of dogs I doubt that you'll see anywhere A pair of playful devils wrapped up in hair and hide But Janie thinks they're lovely and they are her joy and pride Yeah, Janie thinks they're lovely and they are her joy and pride No, well, thank you very much, uh, Trevor, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you a little later on down the track. That'd be nice. I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Jack.